Throughout the lecture series, we have talked about a number of organizational factors, like reputation, trustworthiness, group behaviors, and organizational behavior. However, in this lecture, we talk about the influence of industry and leadership on crises, as these two factors hold additional keys to understanding not only crisis response, but also predicting how organizations are likely to react to crises. So let's start by talking about organization type. Research suggests that in addition to organizational identities, industries themselves often have identities influencing reactions to issues in crisis. What we find is that these industrial identities often create restraints on how organizations can deal with situations. For example, in the 2008-2009 banking crisis, communication professionals found that the complexity and pressures of the industry, media attention, demands for transparency, and the sheer challenge of translating technical financial rules and information so that it was more accessible and tailored to different audiences affected their ability to create two-way interactive communication at all levels that functioned to reassure stakeholders. Alternatively, research has also found that in a number of industries like hospitality or healthcare, there are just different information needs and stakeholder concerns. So both of these factors then, the constraints created by an industry's operational environment, as well as its identity, will influence how organizations react to crises. Industries also contribute to an organization's capabilities, identity, but especially to its reputation. There is no clearer example of this than the banking industry after the financial crash of 2008, where the industry's negative reputation created credibility problems throughout, no matter the particular work of any financial institution. Industries affect organizations and their experiences with crises. For example, Ellsbach's analysis of the California cattle industry examined the construction and effectiveness of verbal accounts across the industry as it faced different crises. One industry that is often studied is the airline industry, with research centering on its crisis response to specific events or even broad industry reactions to changing conditions. But there are some similar studies across different industries with travel and tourism, auto, manufacturing, financial, sports entertainment, and technology industries often studied. Alternatively, it's also useful to think about industries in terms of experiences in managing crises. So thinking of industries as either being crisis prone or non-crisis prone is a useful distinction. In fact, there's a good body of research that suggests that organizations simply respond to crises differently based on their industry's crisis history. This is something to think about when you look for jobs or take on clients. If they're in a crisis-prone industry, then issues in crisis management is a skill set that you'll need. Previous research has identified seven industries that tend to be the most crisis-prone, including finance and insurance, professional scientific and technical services, information like telecommunications, computer software and hardware, transportation and warehousing, manufacturing, mining and travel, and consistently these findings suggest that a history of crisis changes the way that organizations react to crises. However, the internal view of the influence of crises on organizations is seldom studied. And so there's little indication of how industry influences internal crisis communication. Labeled broadly, an organization's values should really be considered as an important factor in influencing its crisis communication. When we consider the concept of an organization's value, most of our understanding of crises and organizational values focuses on the connections between crises and organizational culture, ethics, and corporate social responsibility. Understanding organizational values as they're evident in the artifacts of an organizational culture can provide academics and practitioners strong clues as to how different stakeholder groups are likely to react to crisis response messages. In today's world where authenticity and message credibility are essential components to crisis response, and with stakeholders looking for evidence that the organizations really mean what they say, then understanding these connections is vital.
what both stakeholders and communications professionals have to rely on in making these judgments is the sum total of what an organization has said and done. So stakeholders are therefore judging crisis response messages against what they find or they think they know about an organization. This makes the forms of culture vital in supporting the credibility and the perceived authenticity of crisis response messages. To really dig into organizational culture, I would suggest viewing these two videos. The first focuses on the characteristics and consequences of organizational culture, and the second focuses on the measurable attributes of organizational culture. Naturally, these are also on my YouTube channel and listed under the Issues in Crisis playlist, and they're posted on my website as well. Then the other organizational factor that I want to spend some time talking about is leadership. If we're going to understand crisis leadership, it's important we do so with a bit of distinction between management and leadership functions. In our last lecture, we talked about the function of crisis management, which is largely about getting the right resources deployed at the right time and in the right manner. But in crises, what is also needed in order to manage the crisis from the inside out is effective leadership. Typical business literature separates management and leader function, leadership functions in these ways. Leadership is about relationships and relationship management. Management, however, is functional. This is one of the reasons why great leaders also tend to be very effective communicators because their function is largely relational. With this distinction between leadership and management in mind, let's take a look at the different types of roles that organization leaders can serve during crises. First, leaders serve a vital psychological and emotional role for stakeholders, both inside and outside the organization. Remember that crises heighten people's sense of uncertainty and tend to raise fears and anxiety. What's needed in these times are leaders who can make people feel like it's going to be all right. Brian Gilvari, the CFO at, for BP during the 2010 Gulf of Mexico crisis, talked about the most important thing he did during the crisis was to reassure his teams so that they could focus on shifting the company's assets to be able to free up capital to deal with the crisis. But this isn't just an internal function. A critical component in the psychological and emotional role for leaders in crises is to build trust amongst critical stakeholders. These findings demonstrate some of the most important features of trust in leaders during crises. So if you take a look at what people expect to find, they demand someone who will follow through on their promises, seem transparent, give credit where it's due, and are generous with criticisms, meaning that they don't throw people under the bus. More than that, though, effective crisis leaders also talk about the organization's tough times, demonstrate decisiveness, allow others to speak and participate, and simply do good work. If we take a look at this list of factors that most influence trust in a leader, it's not hard to see why effective leaders have to be good at managing relationships. All of these are about inspiring confidence, and more importantly, about being relatable. One of the outcomes of being trustworthy and reducing fear and anxiety is that good leaders are able to generate optimism in times of crisis. When you take a look at the language used by effective leaders in crises, they tend to acknowledge the struggle, but focus on overcoming and the positive fight. We've seen this in archetype responses across decades, from Churchill's World War II radio addresses, through President Clinton's responses to the terrorist attacks in Oklahoma City, to President Obama's responses to gun violence in the U.S., and more recently, into the way that leaders have responded to attacks in Belgium, Germany, France, London, and Manchester. There is a defiance and a rhetoric of survival that focuses on generating optimism in the face of adversity. Good leadership is about inspiring people. So we contrast this against people who have been less effective crisis managers. And for me, one of the worst examples of this psychological and emotional role would have to have been President Bush after 9-11. I remember listening to his first public statement. I was on my way to work, and there were two key messages that he sent, and, and they said basically that the world was more uncertain, but that we should visit down retribution. I think he was trying, probably trying to acknowledge the struggle and offer a rallying cry, but his rhetoric on the day 
and beyond focused more on messages of, we have a lot to be afraid of, but we're going to go after them. There was really nothing offered that made people feel better. It was a bit of what you could call Old Testament justice appeal, but this aspect of compassion and caring was really lacking, and I think that shaped some of the changes in American identity really for the next decade. So if the psychological and emotional role is a tricky one to maneuver because it balances all three of these purposes, when we start to think about particular behaviors, it gets even trickier. So, it becomes complicated because not only is there a rhetorical aspect of leadership, but there's also a behavioral one. It's one thing to offer reassuring messages, but a leader's behavior in the midst of crisis must also match their rhetoric. From a big picture stance, people want to hear the warm and fuzzies, but they also want to see something happen. This doesn't necessarily mean that they want a die-hard kind of response, but reassurance and a perspective that they believe that the actions their leader are going to be taking are done quickly but thoughtfully. This is one of the reasons why effective crisis planning is going to help an organization respond to a crisis effectively. It gives the leader a pre-considered set of actions that hopefully only need minor adaptations. So those first press conferences where they're giving information are ones where something actually is happening and not just punting the ball down the pitch for a while. All of this, though, meeting people's expectations for what leaders should deliver during crisis to understanding behaviors also requires consistent communication. Notice the first part of this, the honesty bit. People can take bad news, especially when it's delivered in ways that meet the goals that we've been talking about, but it has to be honest. It used to be that organizations could be a bit strategically ambiguous, that they could try to shift the blame a bit, obscure the issues, and generally be, frankly, a bit sleazy, and people would take that. Today's information consumers, though, don't tend to accept that. So if you look at crisis communication research from the 90s, you'll see a lot of discussion about the strategic ambiguity tactic. But these days, people's expectations have simply shifted. The other part of this is that in a 24-7 news cycle, people ex up expect updates from the organization. This is tough, though, because as a crisis is unfolding, it can be hours before anything more is known about the situation. The problem is that the media doesn't just leave stories until there's new information. If the crisis is big enough for instant coverage, then they're going to be looking for all the possible angles and fish until they have something. It's just better coverage. This is one of the reasons that today's organizational leader needs to be an effective communicator because they need to be the person that the media is going to. They need to make themselves regularly available and manage all of this to minimize the speculation and to drive the narrative. During a crisis, leaders have the opportunity to be the agenda-setting agents for the crisis because all the media outlets want to hear from them. One of the worst things a leader can do is not be available for the media. For example, the disappearance of Malaysian Airlines flight that was bound for China has been largely viewed as a PR failure because of a perceived lack of communication from its leaders by the families of the passengers. The problem is that they did regularly update information a few times a day. But as you can imagine, people are incredibly anxious about their friends and family. And the leadership wasn't as sensitive to the communication needs of their stakeholders. So that even though... When they came out to say that there was no new information available, they weren't talking about the process that they were following. They weren't necessarily talking directly to the families. It was all done via a spokesperson and an, at an official press conference. For the largely Chinese families affected, it, this seemed like, like Malaysia Airlines wasn't being forthcoming. The reality was that there just wasn't anything to report, but that didn't really matter. It was the perception that mattered. Effective leaders are also able to make an emotional connection with the stakeholders, with the ones who are directly affected by the crisis and other public stakeholders more broadly. One of the downfalls for BP was that Tony Hayward, who was the CEO at the time, was not a particularly warm or reassuring person. If you look at the text of what he said, aside from his gaffes, he actually said mostly the right things. It's just that his communication style failed to provide the reassurance that the external stakeholders needed. 
he really failed to emotionally connect to people because, frankly, he came across as an overly stuffed shirt, cold person. Finally, in order to be able to meet the psychological and emotional role of crisis leadership, leaders need to be inspiring. So they need to go beyond just making us feel good. They need to make us feel like we're connected to the success of the crisis being managed. When we're talking about inspiration, we're really focusing on charismatic leadership and people who lead their companies through challenging times. Certainly, Steve Jobs was an example of a charismatic leader, but he wasn't the only one in the technology industry who was. During the 1990s, the semiduct semiconductor manufacturing industry was really struggling to be competitive in the U.S., and Bob Noyes created a cross-company research consortium, basically getting competitors to agree to collaborate on research in order to improve semiconductors all the way around. It was called Semitech. What he was able to do because of his approach to leadership was to inspire competitors to collaborate and improve the products in order to become more com globally competitive. These leaders like Noyes, like Nelson Mandela, are able to be successful advocates within their organizations and also outside of them because the same characteristics that draw people to them within their organizations also tend to make them appealing to media outlets and other kinds of stakeholders. But we also have to remember that leaders must serve more than an emotional role. They must also serve functional roles. Now, that's not to say that the same person necessarily needs to be the emotional and functional leaders. In many cases, we'll find that people like Robert Noyes, who are excellent in serving the psychological and emotional roles of crisis leadership, may not be the best functional leaders. It may be that others focus on material crises, so it's about recognizing different aptitudes as a part of the modern organizational leadership as well. So one of the first qualities of the functional role of leadership is that they need the legitimate authority to act in crisis. This is more than just being a boss. For example, President Trump has a massive amount of power conferred to him because of his office. However, the question about his legitimacy to act in a crisis is probably more of a challenge. So when we're talking about power, we're talking about more than the Machiavellian ability to force people to do things they wouldn't ordinarily do. It can mean a lot of different things and can be legitimate depending on the organizational culture and circumstances. So let's take a look at the five sources of power. Any single leader doesn't necessarily have to embody all of these, but the most powerful leaders will have multiple sources of power because it makes them appealing to different types of people and circumstances. The first type of power is reward power. So who signs your bonus check and does that motivate folks? The easiest way to think about reward pow power is a Pavlovian response. If I'm training my dog, I offer him a reward for behaving, and so that reinforces the good behavior that I'm trying to encourage. In a crisis context, when organizations are struggling to solve a problem, sometimes they'll offer rewards for crowdsourcing solutions. It's a positive way to get people to focus on the problem through incentivizing solutions. So employee reward schemes, bonuses, and even customer reward schemes are all ways of harnessing power. On the other side of the coin is coercive power. Now, this is what we often think of in terms of power, what I just called a Machiavellian view of power, where people perform because we hold some power of negative consequences over them. In traditional classrooms, for example, when I'm marking, I hold coercive power over my students. If they perform to fail to my expectations, I can give them a bad mark. That has certainly knock-on effects. While the good mark is nice, it's oftentimes the aversion to the bad mark that probably motivates students more. So this can be an effective way to get what we want out of people, the fear of negative consequences. In the case of crises, because crises produce fear, this can be harnessed effectively to get different stakeholder groups motivated to, to find solutions. Yet, the funny thing about fear is that it has to be wielded very carefully, because there's what we also call a curvilinear relationship between fear and motivation, meaning that fear motivates, but only to a certain point. Then we increase fear beyond this point, the way that people cope with it serves as a demotivator. 
where people will either just not act or act in the exact opposite way that we want. Think about revolutions, mutinies, takeovers. A lot of times when these happen, it's because the fear stops working. Crises can be incredibly overwhelming, so coercive power can be used, but it has to be used cautiously. Third, legitimate power is about the stakeholder perceptions that the leader has the authority and a legitimate right to prescribe behavior for them. Think about this as an age-old kid rebellion. You're not the boss of me. In this case, it's not whether the leader can reward or punish us, but it's about whether we recognize and accept their authority. This comes from the belief that a person has the formal right to make demands and expect others to be compliant and obedient. A president, prime minister, or monarch, for example, has legitimate power. So too does a CEO, religious minister, or fire chief. Electoral mandates, social hierarchies, cultural norms, and organizational structures all provide the basis for legitimate power. This type of power, however, can be really unpredictable and stable. If you lose your title or position, your legitimate power can instantly disappear because the people who are influenced by the dis position rather than by you. Also, the scope of your power is limited to situations that others believe you have the right to control. If a fire chief tells people to stay away from a burning building, for example, they'll likely listen. But if she tries to make two people act more courteously to one another, it's just as likely that they'll ignore the instruction. Fourth, referent power comes from one person liking and respecting another, identifying with them in some way. Celebrities often have referent power, which is why they can influence everything from what people buy to which politician they elect. In a workplace, a person with referent power often makes everyone feel good, so they tend to have a lot of influence. Referent power can be a big responsibility because you don't necessarily have to do anything to, to earn it, so it can be abused quite easily. Someone who's likable but lacks integrity and honesty, may rise to power and can use that power to hurt or alienate people as well as gain personal advantage. Relying on referent power alone tends not to be a good strategy for a leader who wants longevity and respect. When it's combined, however, with expert power, it can help leaders become very successful. In crisis contexts, it can be really useful because there are people who want to get a strong share of the media's coverage. Finally, when you have the knowledge and skills that enable you to understand a situation, suggest solutions, use solid judgment, and generally outperform others, people will listen to you, they'll trust you, and they'll respect what you say. As a subject matter expert, for example, your ideas have value, and others will look to you for leadership in that area. What's more, expert power, you can expand the confidence, decisiveness, and reputation for rational thinking into other subjects and issues. So this is a good way to build and to maintain expert power and also to improve the leadership skills. In a context of a crisis, this is the source of power that can be the most compelling because we want to have faith in the knowledge and the experience of the people in charge of the situation that they just know what they're doing. So if a leader has power then, and hopefully clearly aided by an effective crisis plan, they're able to create an, or implement appropriate procedures to respond to the crisis. Because of the power they have, effective leaders are able to get obedience so that when they say X, Y, and Z needs to happen, it does. One of the challenges in moments of crisis, though, is that people can be easily sidetracked by the situation. So part of the functional role of leaders is to keep people on track so that they're not overly focused on the uncertainty of the situation and the response strategy is actually executed. This works at the organizational level, the stakeholder level, and certainly at the level of a group. When we've talked about the group roles, this is one of the critical roles during crisis preparation and management for the crisis team, focusing on response integrity. The functional role of leadership is an inside-out role because one of the critical components to functional crisis leadership is effectively managing relationships with people.
So effective crisis leaders are able to build on the perceptions of justice for all stakeholders. Now, this doesn't mean the stakeholders are always going to get what they want because of the crisis, but the process for managing the stakeholders' needs has to be transparent and perceived as fair, and leaders have a lot to do with creating and communicating this impression. Because of their leadership role, one of the most important functional tasks that they have is to build long-term group relationships, both within the organization, but also importantly with outside groups. As we've mentioned, crisis situations tend to bring together groups with very different interests, whether it's corporations, government agencies, nonprofit, health organizations, environmental advocacy groups, research groups like universities, or even consumer groups. All of these are types of stakeholders that may not have interacted before together. However, a crisis can result in collaborations between them. So a critical leader for a role during a crisis is to be an effective boundary spanner. So that once the connection to these stakeholders is made, when possible they're maintained, because these relationships often represent important partners for future issue management, innovation, as well as managing new rules and regulations. Along these lines, in a modern organizational environment, creating a participative culture within an organization as an, and between an organization and its stakeholders is an important functional role that leaders can serve. Because stakeholders are looking to leaders, it can be a way to reaffirm or even develop two-way engagement from decision makers to interested stakeholders. In short, Managing relationships with people, a public relations role, is a vital part of functional leadership during crises. But then that also leads us to more traditional public relations roles for leaders. And one of these is asking the question whether the CEO should be the spokesperson or not. Now, conventional wisdom generally says yes, but with a caveat. In serious crises, all stakeholders expect to hear from the boss. But that doesn't necessarily mean that he or she is going to be the only spokesperson. They have to be seen or heard from, but they also have other jobs to do as well, so their presence has to be managed. But this is also moderated by the timing of the crisis and its severity. By timing, what I mean is that the CEO probably isn't the first person that the organization and the public media will hear from. If that's the case, though, if they are the first person, then that signals it's a major crisis. So this can certainly serve to escalate the perception of the severity of the crisis, and that has to be considered. In addition, there's some degree of debate about having CEOs address all crises, because their words on the crisis can make it seem more important, garner more media attention, but certainly if a crisis is severe, they absolutely have to be heard from. And this is something that I mentioned earlier in the chat, but during crises, leaders serve an important agenda-setting function for organizations precisely because of their position. When they're effective communicators, they're able to get their messages out, additional media coverage, and to build a credible narrative about the crisis itself. Of course, all of this requires that organizations and their leaders be truthful ethical, and stakeholder-focused in their communication, but when they are because of the important roles that leaders play, the psychological or emotional, the functional, and the public relations roles, they have the singular opportunity to make really the difference for their organization during crises. However, as we've seen many examples of with pre people like Travis Kalanick from Uber, Tony Hayward of BP, and probably the most obvious of all, President Trump, is that when leaders fail to serve these roles, and in all three of these guys' cases, they have become the source of crisis for the organization. So it can genuinely damage their organization despite any other factors. If you want to take a look at some of the other readings, the sources highlighted throughout, and these ones here are ones that I would definitely recommend.